I hope you can now all see that and I hope you can hear me. Looks good. Sounds good, John. Perfect. Thanks. So thanks so much to Phil and to Catherine for everything for today. Um, I'm not going to talk about beauty um, directly, but I'm going to talk a bit about some art, some art history. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about what I think is a fascinating moment in history that saw what was probably the first sustained modern revival of Stoicism. And it was centred around a relatively small group of people, one of whom was the 17th century Flemish painter, Peter Paul Rubens. Oops, sorry, I'm having, here we go. So this is Rubens. Now, Rubens might not be the first artist you think of as potentially stoic in outlook. He's usually remembered for his rather fleshy, sensual images that people might naturally associate with pleasure rather than virtue. But in fact, Rubens was deeply interested in Stoicism, and that's what I want to talk about today. He produced a number of Stoic-themed paintings. So let me start with what is possibly the most famous of these, which is his painting, The Death of Seneca. Now, there are multiple copies of this painting. There's one in Munich, which I think was probably the, is probably the, um, the earliest, um, one in Madrid, uh, and that's the one that you can see here, and also one in Antwerp. So it was a, uh, an image that he came back to again and again. Now, this painting depicts Seneca committing suicide in his bath. And as you can see, it's a very small bath. Um, and this is an event that had been described by the Roman historian Tacitus. Now, Rubin's painting of Seneca takes inspiration from two separate pieces of ancient sculpture. The first of these was a portrait bust that had only recently been identified, and as it turns out, probably mistakenly, as a bust of Seneca in the 1590s, so just a couple of decades earlier. And there are multiple copies of this bust too, including one that Rubens bought whilst visiting Rome and had installed on the wall of his house in Antwerp. This is a view of Rubens' house in Antwerp. It's now a museum, you can visit it. Um, I think it's closed this year for restoration. And if you look at the door um, on the right hand side under the pediment, you can see the head of Seneca. And it looks to me as if that might be Socrates further along higher up on the wall, but we'll, we'll put that to one side for a minute. But Seneca is there placed above the doorway in, in Ruben's house. Now, there's another copy of this closer to my home in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford which may in fact have been the one that Rubens originally owned. This bust in Oxford was bought from Rubens' collection just after his death by the Duke of Buckingham and was eventually donated to the museum in Oxford. The one that I've just shown you that's now at Rubens' house in Antwerp is in fact a later replacement that was bought when the house was being restored, I think in the late 19th century or the early 20th century. And there are many other copies of this bust of Seneca too. Here are just a few examples. These are all photos that I've taken at various places whenever I've come across Seneca. And one of these was, was taken in Rome. One was taken in a country house in Norfolk. I can't remember where the third one was taken maybe Paris. But anyway, they're all ones that I've come across. Just to reiterate the point that there are multiple copies of this image. This image was widely thought to be of Seneca throughout the 17th and the 18th centuries until in the early 19th century, another bust was found, this one, which as you can see, has got the name Seneca inscribed in it. And ever since then, the older ones that I've just been showing you are referred to as pseudo Seneca, right? So much for the head in Rubin's painting. What about the body? 
For this, Rubens took inspiration from another piece of ancient sculpture, now known as the Dying Fisherman. On the face of it, this sculpture has nothing to do with Seneca. Perhaps Rubens just liked it. However, the statue as it exists today and how it was in Rubens time um, had been heavily restored. So the torso and the head are antique. The arms are, I think, newer replacements. And when I say newer, I mean 16th century. Um, the loincloth has been added and the basin in which the figure stands. Now, as I say, it was probably restored in this way during the 16th century. Indeed, it may have been restored in this way to make it look like an image of Seneca by making it fit with the famous account of Seneca's death in Tacitus. And the basin is significant here. Um, Tasta says that Seneca opened his veins in the bath. And earlier in the Renaissance, this had been interpreted as a moment of last minute baptism, effectively turning Seneca into a Christian just before he dies. But because Seneca's blood mingled with the baptismal water, this made him a Christian martyr, assuming we interpret his death not as a suicide, but as an execution. Now, in order to illustrate this, the statue figure, perhaps reconstructed in order to portray Seneca, is placed literally within a baptismal font. And that's perhaps why the bath is so small. So this was probably not originally a statue of Seneca at all, but it may have been reconstructed in the 16th century in order to create an image of Seneca's martyrdom. And this is what Rubens is painting. Rubens also painted an image of a bust of Marcus Aurelius. And this was part of a portrait of the humanist Caspar Gavatius, who was preparing an edition of Marcus Aurelius's meditations at the time, although his edition was never published. Gavatius was also based in Antwerp, like Rubens. He was a humanist, he worked as city clerk, and he was hired by Rubens to act as tutor for his son. Gavatius also composes an epitaph for Rubens' monument after the artist's death. Now, while Gavatius was clearly an admirer of Marcus Aurelius, the bust represented in the painting was not his. It in fact belonged to Rubens, who probably acquired it while he was in Italy, just as he had done with the head of Seneca. The painting then is deliberately composed by Rubens, bringing together his subject, with an item from his own collection that perfectly illustrates the subject's interests. Along with Rubens, Gavatius was part of a small community of people in Antwerp interested in Stoicism in the early 17th century, a community that had its origins in the century before. Another member of this community was Rubens' older brother, Philip. Philip is especially important in this story because he was a friend and pupil of the foremost Stoic of the period, Justus Lipsius. Along with other things, Philip wrote Stoic-themed poetry in honour of his teacher. Rubens painted Philip and Lipsius together during a trip to Italy sometime around 1603. So Rubens and his brother Philip are in the center. And um, I can't see it so clearly here because it's slightly obscured by the, by the um, um, Zoom stuff on the side, but on the, right hand, on the very right-hand side, you can see Lipsius looking over them. Now, Philip was indeed with his brother in Italy at the time, but Lipsius wasn't present. His image has been added to this painting as if a guiding spirit watching over the two brothers. But far more important is another portrait of the two together in perhaps what is Rubens' most stoic painting, The Four Philosophers. So this image painted in 1611, 1612 shows four figures. And let's uh, 
zoom into the central section. The four figures are Rubens himself on the left, then his brother Philip, then Lipsius, and then Johannes Wovarius. The vase in the alcove above them contains four flowers, two open and two closed, which is thought to echo the fact that two of the people in the painting by this point were dead. Lipsius had died in 1606 and Philip far more recently in 1611. So this painting is perhaps Rubin's tribute to his brother. Wovarius had been a pupil of Lipsius too, living in his house at one point. And after Lipsius's death, Wovarius acted as his literary executor, seeing Lipsius's final works through to publication. You can also see in the alcove Rubin's bust of Seneca. In the background, you can see glimpses of columns, placing the group literally inside a stoa. Lipsius, the teacher, is explaining the contents of a large book, um, as you can see here. Perhaps his famous edition of the complete works of Seneca, published in 1605, the year before he died. So this is Lipsius's great edition of the complete works of Seneca. A quick note on this book. Um, he publishes it right at the end of his career. It contains a number of engravings, engravings of both Lipsius himself and of Seneca, as well as this impressive engraved title page. When the book was reprinted in 1615, just after the Four Philosophers painting, the publisher, who I'll come back to in a moment, asked Rubens to prepare new drawings for better engravings, which he did. And this was prompted by notes that Lipsius himself left just before his death, because he was unhappy with some of the original engravings. The portrait of Lipsius himself is updated. So here, before and after. Um, a large image of Seneca's bust is included, replacing a previous one. And an engraving of Rubin's painting, The Death of Seneca, is added. And this is, full, this is a full page uh, folio image, it's a very large, large reproduction. And even the small image of Seneca on the title page has been updated. Now, this edition of Seneca was published by the famous printing firm of Christopher Plantin, also based in Antwerp. By 1605, when the book came out, Plantin himself was dead. The company had passed on to his son-in-law, Jan Moretus, and then in 1610 to his son, Balthazar Moretus, who had gone to school with Rubens and had also been a student of Lipsius. The printing shop still survives. It's the only one from the period to do so, and it's now a museum. So if you go to visit Antwerp, you can visit Rubens' house and you can visit the Plantin Moretus printing um, uh, museum where many of the Stoic books produced, uh, written by Lipsius were, were printed. Now, Plantin had been more or less a contemporary of Lipsius and his firm published all of Lipsius's works. The two were close friends and whenever Lipsius was in Antwerp, he stayed with Plantin. And Plantin's own printer's mark is often thought to illustrate his own interest in Stoicism, labore et constantia. Indeed, much later, Rubens would produce designs for an updated version of this printer, printer's mark for his old schoolmate, Balthazar Moretus. And so this is one of Rubens' drawings. Among the works by Lipsius that Plantin printed, the most famous was his De Constantia of 1584. This was a book of stoic guidance for those facing adversity. And this was a period of great adversity brought about by intense religious wars. 
At one point, Antwerp was sacked and people literally had to run for their lives. Lipsis's own house was ransacked twice and he lost pretty much everything. So it was a dangerous time. And in this context, Lipsius argues in De Constantia that real evils are in the mind, the product of one's opinions. And so in order to escape them, one must change how one thinks, not one's location. Drawing on ideas from Seneca, Lipsius argues that change is simply inevitable. It's either the product of divine providence or blind fate, but either way, it's out of our control. And difficult situations um, can in fact be an opportunity for us to exercise and improve our virtues, as Seneca had argued. Drawing on his vast historical knowledge as a humanist, Lipsius outlines the countless wars and conflicts that have raged throughout human history, reminding himself that this is far from uncommon. War, strife, conflict, trouble, change. These are things millions of people have had to contend with. And so why should he, Lipsius, be any different in having to confront them in his own life? In any case, there's nothing he can do to stop it. What he can do is try to develop the resilience and fortitude, the constantia, so that he can weather the storm. Now, Lipsius's Constantia was, if you like, the first modern Stoic handbook, the first book that aimed to present practical Stoic ideas to a modern audience, but also one that acknowledged that some aspects of ancient Stoicism might need to be updated in the process, although in ways quite different to the ways in which we might think about updating Stoicism today. And it was also a huge bestseller. It was reprinted numerous times and translated into almost all of the major vernacular languages uh, within a decade of publication. Plantin himself printed translations into Dutch and into French the year after its initial publication. And the Dutch version was done by Plantin's son-in-law, Jan Moretus. And it was translated into English no less than four times in the um, decades after its first publication. Lipsius also published scholarly works on Stoicism, which were the first to try to gather together all of the fragmentary evidence that we have for the early Greek Stoics. And here again, you can see Plantin's printer mark, Labore et Constantia. So, in this small group of intellectuals in Antwerp, comprising a mixture of scholars, artists, and printers, we find what I think is the first modern Stoic community. And these are some of the people that I've mentioned along the way. And the intellectual father figure for this group was without doubt, Justus Lipsius, author of the first modern Stoic handbook, the first book that tries to present Stoic ideas as a guide for how to live. And a key member of the second generation of this community of Stoics in Antwerp was, as I've said, Peter Paul Rubens, not an artist of Baroque hedonism, but a serious and committed Stoic. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was fascinating. And I think the parallels between this time period of neo-Stoicism and modern Stoicism are inescapable. I was wondering if you have any thoughts as one of the founders of modern Stoicism, were you drawing on the neo-Stoic period or did you have any hopes that there might be something similar going on with modern Stoicism? Um, I mean, not, not explicitly when we first started. No, not at all. But um... I mean, I, I mean, one question that people have asked me again and again and again over the last decade or so is, why do you think people are so interested in Stoicism right now? 
Okay, that's the question that keeps coming up. And I've tried to come up with various answers to that, to that, and I'm very interested to hear other people's views on it too. But I mean, you can point to perhaps reasons why, I mean, since the financial crash in 2008, um, I think was a, was a key moment. Um, and people have found the world a little more unsettled. Um, the idea that everything's always improving and that everyone's getting wealthier um, that kind of, sort of optimism um, that um, that was around beforehand suddenly went, and people are feeling as if they're perhaps in slightly more unsettled times. And I think in the 16th century, when Lipsius was writing, he was, you know, they were most definitely in unsettled times. This was, you know, the you know the Reformation and the Counter Reformation. There was a, a lot of religious conflict, and the, all of the older certainties were suddenly being called into question. And I think perhaps that sense of uncertainty might be something that um, you know, might be a common cultural context that has led people to turn to some Stoic ideas. Do you think that led the Neo-Stoics to emphasize constancy? It's interesting to me that that seems to be the primary virtue that they concern themselves with, whereas today we hardly ever talk about constancy. I mean, was that why? Because of the Reformation period and all the societal changes happening then? Well, I mean, people, I mean, we, we talk about resilience, right? I mean, I guess that's the sort of the updated, the updated version. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, if we're talking about resilience, I mean, I suppose another parallel as well is that if they're talking about constancy, um, they're talking about managing emotions, right? They're, they're, they're engaged in the kind of the psychotherapeutic side of stoicism that's a big part of the, the modern stoic scene, right? Um, how can people manage their emotions? How can people become more resilient? Um, how can they cope with the stresses and strains of everyday life? So is that that side of, of things, I think, where we where we see the parallel quite strongly as well? I like that. Resilience is the new constancy. All right. So some questions more particularly on the images that you shared. Um, Francis Gasparini says, in what way does the printer's mark represent stoicism? So. Um, so the, the two words, labor, labore et constantia, so constantia, the, as I say, the stoic idea that we've just been talking about, and labore, I mean, labor, hard work, so, you know, kind of hard work and resilience. Um, um, so I think the constantia there is, is you know, um, I think comes through as clearly an echo of, 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 of Lipsius's focus on constantia in his explicitly... Um, Stoic works, which of course were in, and, and is inspired by um, Seneca's dialogue, De Constantia Sapientis, right on the on the constancy of the sage. Right. Thank you. And a question from Eric Rubens is widely known for portraying what we now know as Rubenesque figure, which of course you alluded to earlier, flesh and pleasure. Considering restraint, moderation is one of the major Stoic virtues. Why was that virtue not extended to portraying the human body, especially the female body? Or did he intend to use the Rubenesque figure to signify the lack of virtue? Um. <laughs> yeah. Um. Why would we consider why would why would we consider those representations of the female form unvirtuous? I suppose would be my sort of counter question, right? Um, so representing nature in a way. Yeah. It, yes. Like the Greeks with their statues. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so a question from Roberto, how did they in the 17th century manage to make Stoicism compatible with Catholic counter-reform? Yes, it's interesting. So, so Lipsius himself starts off as a Catholic. Um, he then um, perhaps is, is it, you know, it, he, he then for a, for a certain period converts to Protestantism in order to take up a job in Protestant Leiden. Um, and then he later goes to, um, um, to, to Catholic Louvain and converts back to Catholicism and dies a Catholic. 
right? And this has been interpreted in a number of ways. So on the one hand, it's been interpreted as kind of cheap opportunism, right? He needed to convert to take the job, and so he did it. Um, um, it's also been thought that you know, he was more interested in being uh, in being a Christian in a way that transcended those 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 differences. And perhaps, you know, he was a kind of a deist before before deists existed in the 18th century. Um, and of course, there's this hef heavy Stoic influence on on him as well. So he's kind of working in a Catholic context, and in the end, he he he, he returns to Catholicism. Um, but. But that, yeah, there's a sense in which we might we might think of we might think of him trying to interpret Seneca in broadly Christian terms, but without wanting to get too embroiled in those sorts of in those sorts of disputes. If that makes sense. Okay, sure. Thank you. We also have a question from Terry in London. Was narcissism a factor at that time as now? <laughs> uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Probably narcissism is always there in some form, right? <laughs> um, okay, so if anyone has any further questions for John, now would be the time to put them in the chat. Um, maybe just another question about what modern Stoicism can learn from Neo-Stoicism. I really like the fact that the Neo-Stoics employed a lot of allegorical symbols. I mean, we saw them in some of the images that you shared. Do you see that, I mean, it's considered to be not very sophisticated now to use this type of allegorical symbolization in art, I think, or in music. Do you see a place for that? If we if we were going to bring back Stoic art, for example, um, how would that actually look? Mm, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, as you say, there's a sense in which um, fashions have moved on and you, that's perhaps not the way in which people would... Um, would naturally do it now. I mean, I mentioned very briefly that Philip's Philip Rubens wrote Stoic-inspired poetry. Um, just uh, to pick up on on where we started um, today's event, and I think Catherine at one point said, you know, perhaps we should all start writing Stoic poetry. So it may be that there are some 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 art forms that we could take where we could take some inspiration from from these guys. But it's not as if we're going to go back to particularly. Um, um uh we're unlikely to sort of you know try and resurrect 16th or 17th century sort of traditions in art for sure um but again i mean to pick up some of the other things that other speakers have said already um you know beautiful things are a way are a very good effective way of transmitting ideas um i remember in the very early days of modern stoicism jules evans saying one of the great features of um, ancient Stoic literature is it's beautifully written and it engages people. Seneca's a great writer. That's part of his power, right? Um, it's not as if he's simply presenting the ideas in a bland and uninteresting way. He's a great writer who presents them in a way that makes them very forceful and powerful. And we remember, we remember quotations, right? Because of the way in which they're written. That's an example of beauty being used in an effective moral way. And we can do that visually, um, we can do that with poetry, and we can do it with well-written prose. And so these are all ways in which art, understood in the broadest terms, can be a useful vehicle for presenting ideas in a way that makes them stick in our mind. Wonderful. So this is a call to more Stoic art, more Stoic literature, more Stoic engagement with, with beauty in general. Absolutely. 